Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. You know, back in around hmm, uh, 2004 or so, I, I met Sumit Saxena. He was with Meheru Jaswala, right. and they came to the studios of Hawaii Public Radio, and we had a show about the science at the East West Center. At the time, I remember that Meheru Jaswala, who has since passed, was uh, dealing in uh, satellite technology. Mm -hmm. She was a she was a star in satellite technology. Right, you were right. right there working with her, yeah. Right, right, right. You know, so mm -hmm. welcome back. It's always nice to have you. And as I said before we began the show, we're getting old together. So <laughs> we, yeah. Thanks, Jay. It's always a pleasure to be back here. I think this is my fourth visit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Yeah. Great to share all the yeah. stuff with you. <laughs> so I mean, you've you've done something very interesting lately. Uh, you're an environmental scientist, an environmental engineer at East West Center, and you know for. Those of you who may not understand that, you know, East West Center is more than just um, diplomacy. Right. It's more than just, um, you know, well, I want to call it uh, social issues around the Pacific. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's also science. Right. And it has some very distinguished scientists there who write very distinguished papers. And Sumit is one of them. And um, uh, that's why it's so interesting to hear him talk about his recent trip. And his trip involved... Uh, uh, air quality sensors, one of which is on the table. We're going to talk about that. Um, and uh, he went to uh, to Vietnam and to India mm -hmm. to test them out as a kind of uh, for the use by citizen citizen scientists mm -hmm. in those areas um, to get a handle with an app and and the mm -hmm. sensors mm -hmm. get a handle on the quality of uh, of the air there. So what motivated you to make this trip, Sumit? You know, actually, you touched a relevant point when you mentioned that the ESO Center is known only for, primarily known only for diplomacy and social issues and cultural training and leadership programs. And so we do have a science uh, department or a division. And in recent years, we have been trying to see how to translate the science work into the public policy fields, into the diplomacy fields, into the leadership field. And there are many ways to do that, and one of the ways that we are trying to experiment with, that is, how do you link research, academic research, with practical stuff, with diplomacy, with leadership, is to do, try it through something that we are calling the citizen science. Uh, I mean, yeah. not, not, it's not an Easter Center term, but it's something mm -hmm. that we uh, found there, and we said, okay, let's try this out. And the other thing that we are trying to, in this specific context, uh, we are trying to do is to initiate some work on smart cities in Asia. You know, the East West Center, we work only in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, some cities there in Asia have taken a leap in terms of building the infrastructure for smart cities uh, in terms of, you know, Wi-Fi, broadband, yeah. tele telecommunications, sure. yeah. hotspots, stuff Which that I really don't understand. But that's the skeleton, that's the backbone. Yeah, it ultimately uh, goes to quality uh, of uh, life, doesn't uh, it? Yeah, and that is the essential first step, of course. Without that, without that infrastructure backbone, nothing else will happen in smart city programs. Yeah. But I don't think people have thought enough about that. Assuming one day you have that fantastic infrastructure, everyone has broadband, everyone has free... Uh, a Wi-Fi in a cafe or wherever, what is going to be the knowledge content or what is going to be the environmental knowledge content of these networks that's going to help in smart cities yes. program? So that was one hook that we were trying to uh, you know, attach ourselves to, and the other hook is the citizen science. Uh, so, you know, there's a variant of it called participatory research. Mm -hmm. Participatory research, basically, you're trying to address the problems of a community. But rather than assume that you know, A, what the problem is, B, you know how to study it, C, you know what the solutions are, rather than assume all that, you say, guys, let's sit down together, tell us what your problems are, let, prioritize them for us, um, what, what kind of data collection methods you think are appropriate. 
what uh, would you like us to do with the results and so on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there are so many, so many <laughs> points and right. factors and vectors right. of right. what you described. Let me unpack, at least in my perception, some of them. Number one, of course, as we both discussed, uh, the East-West Center does more than just di diplomacy and culture and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, public policy. Um, it does science. But it's also, and it does science all over mm -hmm. the Pacific Rim, including as far as India, um, which is, um, you know, a, a mainstay. And I think uh, it is our mm -hmm. East-West Center, mm -hmm. meaning it belongs to Hawaii. Sure, it's got a lot of funding by the federal, well, it's got, it's got reduced funding, but some funding by the federal government. But it is ours. Right. It, it lives in the university. It, it, it's, in, mm. it's in our community. It operates out of our community. And it travels a lot. And what does it travel with? Many, many things. But mm -hmm. one of the things it travels with is science. Mm -hmm. And that's impressive. And it's, it, it's an altruistic, completely altruistic mm -hmm. kind of thing, what you do. The other thing is you're using modern technology. Mm -hmm. Call it citizen science technology, mm -hmm. which is you know which the the common man woman can use mm -hmm. uh, in terms of finding out about mm -hmm. that person's mm -hmm. environment. Um, so that's another thing, and and that, that's more than taking test tubes out there. It's taking um, devices out there that anyone can use. That's mm -hmm. another fact. And finally, um, it's it's got this whole notion of the app. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you can gain tremendous amount of data mm -hmm. using the app by individual citizen scientists, mm -hmm. and then you can you can collate and analyze that data mm -hmm. using computers, um, and it tells us much more ab about our world. Right. Um, we're, we're having a fire drill in the building, Sumi. Yeah, so, I heard that, uh, yeah. Let, <laughs> so let me, let me, let's take a short break, okay. and we'll come back when, when the fire drill dies down. It's only a drill, Sumi. Okay, so I won't need to measure the smoke. <laughs> no, there's no smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of New Japanese Language Show on Think Tech Hawaii, called Konnichiwa Hawaii, broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. And finally, this is Sumit Saxena. He's an environmental scientist at the East West Center, and he's just made a trip to Vietnam and, um, and India, which we'll talk about, um, with um, sensors that measure uh, air quality. And, and, and that do scientific analysis on air quality. So the point I make is that, is that we need to know more about the environment in, in, a, in, a, in a world which, is, um, which has increasing difficulties with the environment, where the environment is degrading while we watch. We, we need to know more about it uh, everywhere. There are no exceptions to this. And so when you go to a, a place that does have issues with air quality, you're learning things that are applicable everywhere. It's a right, great right. contribution. So tell us, uh, you know, so I, I guess I would say that I've stated what I think is your purpose. Am I right? Oh, you are absolutely right. Uh, so now let me add to that now. When we at the East West Center want to initiate programs on smart cities or uh, citizen science, uh, we could have chosen from umpteen topics, but our in-house expertise is largely on issues such as land use change, forestry, uh, climate change, and air pollution. Now, I'm the air pollution guy at the East West Center, so I'm using that as a lens or as a channel into smart cities and citizen science initiatives. So now to step back a bit, uh, recently the World Health Organization has estimated that worldwide about one and a half million people are dying prematurely because, Respiratory issues because of over uh, air, air, air pollution in urban areas. There's of also, of course, another uh, a little higher figure for air pollution from 
uh, household cooking in poor countries, but that's uh, another issue altogether. The work I'm talking, going to talk about today is the urban air pollution in Asian cities. So of this worldwide global figure of one and a half million or so deaths. Uh, this is per annum. Uh, sorry? Per annum. Per annum, yeah, yeah per annual. I would say more than 80 percent is in the Asia Pacific region. And as you can guess, most of that's happening in China and uh, India. Yeah. So it's, it's clearly it's a hot issue that's worthy of attention at the East-West Center. Now, for almost 30 years, I have been uh, mainly doing risk assessment for air pollution issues. But uh, and one thing, uh, one component there is the monitoring of air pollution. Now, traditionally, air pollution has been monitored just like you measure weather, you know, temperature, humidity, pressure, sure. wind speed, you have these massive devices, they can be as big as a post box, and you install them on tops of buildings. Uh, and you, that's how government and scientists have been measuring air pollution. Now, that those, of course, are the gold standard in terms of uh, research or scientific credibility. But those are expensive, A. And because they are expensive, uh, you can't have monitoring stations all over the city. For example, I think Oahu just has two or three of them. On the tops of buildings. And tops of buildings. I think one in Barber Point. Uh, and somewhere. they radio their data yeah, back to the central they, point. These days, a lot of stations in the world radio in their data using telemetry. Earlier, it used to be just you download the data, you pass it on manually, and so on. But yeah. yes, you're right. Now they do have systems which, where online, in real time, you can radio in the data to a central uh, command station. Uh, so, is, but, is there a metric, I mean, uh, in other words, um, is there you know a scale of mm -hmm. some kind, one to 10? And if you're at one, you know, you don't have a lot of particles in the air. If you're at 10, you do. Something like yeah, see, that. Yes, see, the most uh, scientific and fundamental way of measuring it is in, basically in terms of density, how many grams of the pollutant per gallon of air or per liter, liter of air, so on. But that's a metric that citizens or most co uh, common people won't understand. You know, if I tell you so many nanograms per meter cube, it doesn't make any sense. To you. So for that reason, for primarily to communicate uh, the risks due to air pollution, many years ago, different governments developed what we call an air quality index. So it's a scale, as you said. One could be the least polluted and 10 could be most polluted. Sometimes even that 1 to 10 scale or 1 to 100 scale cannot be understood by the common man. So it had to be uh, further simplified, further classified. So now you, they talk of these in terms of color bands. So like uh, code red means it's absolutely bad. Uh -huh. Don't, uh, you know, and everybody don't can start off. Yeah. That. yeah, today is like the, you know, in the military sense or security yeah, sense, right, code, right. code red. Like threat. <laughs> threat. So absolutely don't start out of your house. Code orange could mean if you're a healthy individual, you can go out, you can take a morning walk, you can have a workout, but uh, uh, senior citizens, young babies, anyone who has asthma or any other respiratory allergy better yeah. stay at home. A code orange could mean that, you know, things are bad, but not too bad, don't overexert yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, green is, yeah, great, just, uh, just go out and do whatever you want. So what's a good color now? Uh, yeah, of course, it depends on how different uh, jurisdictions have codified this, but yeah. obviously code green is... Oh, uh, green, and green is good. Good, yeah. I think green, yellow, orange, red, it these are the typical... follows the rainbow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so coming back, uh, so that's the traditional way and the scientific way to do it is uh, very expensive. And there's also a cultural movement now because of social media and, you know, Facebook and WhatsApp. People demand information, right? Uh, there's a consciousness, there's an awareness, people want to know what's happening to their environment. And for that, you just can't rely on just two or three uh, stations in uh, Hanoi or two or three stations in right. Jakarta and so on. So yeah. people began to develop uh, sensors uh, which are A, inexpensive, B, they are uh, portable and light, three, um, and they're easy to use. The ones no. you're talking about send the signal, send the data back by what? By, no, by see, cell phone a sensor, signal or what? No, a sensor by definition is something that simply measures. 
So when we talk of an environmental sensor, yes. it, it is something that either you're measuring water quality or you're measuring uh, air pollution, a specific pollutant. That sensor is tailored to measure a certain pollutant in air or a certain mm -hmm. pollutant in water. Now the device can be made more sophisticated by having the ability to store the data on a chip and then later you hook the device to a computer and download the data. Mm -hmm. You can make it all even more sophisticated by connecting that sensor to a Wi-Fi and then in real time you're able to look at how things are changing in time mm -hmm. and space. So uh, you have these options and the more uh, bells and whistles you have, obviously the device becomes more expensive, more uh, sophisticated and more challenging to use. But that's the trend. Though. Yeah. That but people uh, want the more sophisticated, more sophisticated ones. ones. So till now, basically, uh, there have been a dozen or so companies that have developed sensors for air pollution, largely smoke, uh, uh, focusing on smoke, that is particulate matter, in more common words, dust. So, and these work on a kind of laser scattering principle. And, uh, so far, the devices that the commercially available devices are the types that you buy it, you put it in your bedroom, or you put it in your living room. People do that. Yeah, they've been doing that. Oh, and uh, you hook it up to your Wi-Fi, or you uh, every now and then you download the data, and uh, then you have the confidence that you know that in my living room or in my bedroom, this is how bad the pollution is. Or if you thought you had done a good job of buying an excellent Filter, uh, you know, air conditioning system yeah. with filtration and all it. that. Then you can see that. This is for you. This is for your house, yeah, and this, your yeah, room, right. and your your air. Yeah. yeah. And one analogy I'd like to draw is that sometimes you're not happy knowing what the ambient temperature or humidity is. You know, you don't want to go to AccuWeather. You don't want to go to weather underground. You would rather have a small device in your living room or your bedroom that shows you what the temperature and humidity are. Another, another analogy is that uh, you might want to measure your own blood pressure, right? Now, maybe the device that you use that you buy from Costco or Long's is not as accurate at, as the one at uh, Queen's or at Kaiser. Sure. But for whatever reason, you, are, you and your doctor are satisfied that within the levels of accuracy, that's going to give you some early warning signals or some uh, ballpark number of where your blood pressure is or getting back to the temperature thing that you you know you're in the ballpark of yeah. a comfortable environment yeah. temperature so you don't need to be highly you, yeah you don't need to be precise to the third or fourth yeah. decimal place or so on yeah so th that's the analogy i like to use with what's happening in the air pollution sensors and because i'm the first to acknowledge that these sensors are far from accurate and even some of the manufacturers are pretty uh, candid about it they say that we know that this is not stuff that you're going to use to publish in science journal or nature journal, but it is something that, they, of course, they're making efforts to make it more uh, accurate, but they know that right now it can be used in ways that make citizens uh, feel that they have some control of their, over their lives. Okay, so when we're talking about uh, this device. Yeah. Let's, I mean, it's, it's become mysterious already on the table. <laughs> can, can you tell us, this, I'm sure this is not the only one. Yeah. There are others on the market. Right. Uh, where do you get this and what does it do? And how popular is it and why do you prefer it? Yeah, I came across this uh, when I was uh, doing a Google search to find out how many such manufacturers and brands are out there. And th there are a couple of things that I liked about this particular device, which most other uh, commercially available uh, sensors don't have. And that is that this also has the ability to uh, track your movement and With measure. GPS using GPS. Now, as I told you, it, this is just a sensor. It doesn't have the electronics for the Wi-Fi or for directly, you know, connecting to the any kind of telecommunication uh, setup. But the manufacturers are smart. What they did is they put in a Bluetooth here, and with the Bluetooth, you connect to your Android phone, and then basically it is using the computing power of your phone 
to do everything else. So inside this device are only two things, the environmental sensor and the Bluetooth. It's brilliant. Uh, yeah. It's brilliant. And you're not doing du duplication because no, you're using yeah. the phone instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all you need, so now this particular device uh, is measuring, it can measure temperature, humidity, and three sizes of particulate matters, mm. PM1, PM2.5, and PM10. Well, These what, are, what are those things? PM is particulate matter, so the smaller the particle diameter, the you know more likely it can go to the deepest parts of your lung you know, when you inhale. Yeah. So those are the most dangerous guys. So PM1 yes. is the most dangerous guy. Then PM2.5 is uh, the intermediate diameter and PM10. Now PM10 is what is being measured in Asia because that's, you know, in Asia it's, they find it more, uh, you know, difficult to transition to the expensive PM2.5 measuring devices. In the US, PM2.5 has become the standard. Uh, the EPA is measuring PM2.5, and they've just been about uh, big on measuring PM1 also. So this device is PM1, PM2.5, and PM10, and also temperature and humidity. And as I said, you have, if you have Google Maps on your phone, it, uh, it's recording your uh, latitude and longitude every second, every three seconds, and every three seconds it's recording how, how polluted the place was where you were. And you can, when you, there's a simple on and off button and on the app too, you can start and end a session and you can annotate the session any way you want. And at the end of it, you come back home and you can look at either the charts that within the last half an hour, uh, you know, how did the chart go up and down. Yeah. But you can also see it on the Google uh, map that which route you took. <clears throat> and at each point of the route, they color, they color coded because, uh, and I've seen in my uh, pilot studies in Vietnam and India, whenever I'm at a traffic signal, you know, because the cars are all idling and there's oh, more, sure. more emissions, yeah. uh, it spikes up. So whenever yeah. I see an orange or a red dot on the Google map, I know, okay, that was a place where my, <laughs> whatever I was traveling in, the bus or the auto rickshaw or a taxi uh, is there. Oh. So, okay, let me ask yeah. some questions. Okay, so this is this is gathering data, temperature, um, and those uh, those uh, C C one two point five, C M one two point five yeah, right, and ten, right. um, and uh, it's it's uh, it's saving it, mm -hmm. uh, or rather, it's transmitting it immediately, yeah. immediately right. um, to an app which yeah. you have downloaded yeah. on your yeah. smartphone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got to be reasonably close to it. You got to be Bluetooth Blue away close, from it. Right, right. And then the, your 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 phone is going to be generating mm -hmm. a, a database mm -hmm. with various fields mm -hmm. for the particulates right. and location and humidity and temperature mm -hmm. and whatever else. It's quite mm -hmm. amazing. This little thing, and you can wear it on your on yeah. a lanyard or yeah. on your chest. Can you carry it in your pocket? No, yeah. you have to be open to the air, right? Yeah, but what I often do is I just put it here. Yeah, the, oh, the open openings here they're not blocked. Yeah, and I like it. This is so small; it goes into the pocket, and my nose is not very far from the inlet. So mm -hmm. I'm getting a pretty good uh, uh, metric or a measure of what the pollution is in this zone. Yeah, it looks like a handkerchief, you know, <laughs> a folded hand, very debonair. <laughs> you can wear it in a suit pocket like as well. It. It'll <laughs> happen someday. I don't know whether you saw the photographs a couple of years ago. There was a very high-end uh, modeling show in Beijing uh, where what they were modeling were uh, air pollution masks. <laughs> So these very beautiful Chinese models, uh, it was not the clothes that the people were looking at, it was the masks. And I'm sure each mask must have been like $500, $1,000, because it's, you know, <laughs> for that type of crowd. But the fashion. Uh, it's now entered the fashion world. Yeah? So what does this cost? Yeah, so this particular thing cost two hundred and fifty dollars, which is about the same cost as uh, it's uh, you know the other the other uh, the brands. Uh, but most of the other brands that, and I'm testing out those also, they don't have the mobility mode. Um, they, the GPS, the, the GPS thing, they don't have it as yet. They they just get your um, coordinates from your Wi-Fi, and they uh, live stream the data to a cloud. And everyone, anywhere in the world who is a member or who signs up for free to become a part of that website, you can look at 
uh, what the, these sensors, which are located in different parts of the world, what kind of data they're reporting. So that, that was the link that I'd like to cover with you. So you can look at it for yourself. You can Bluetooth it to your phone. You can go home and put it on your screen. Um, and you can, you can see what, what you've done. But you also want to upload it to some sort of network system, yeah. which can tell you all about the city you're in, or the country you're in, or the world you're in, right? Yeah, actually, now that really is the most exciting part, because uh, I started off by saying you might be curious about your own uh, exposure levels, but the most fascinating aspect is then this all becomes part of the cloud, the data, and if you're willing to, that is, and the crowdsourcing kind of uh, movement that's going on. So. This particular device is linked to a website called Habitat Map. Habitat so, Map. Map. So it didn't begin with the air pollution component. It just began as a, a website where people could report what's happening in their neighborhood in terms of whether it's crime or whether it is garbage or whether it's the quality of roads or whatever social or environmental issues in their neighborhood. Uh, that be It became a, a place where people could describe their neighborhoods in their own terms and that they could provide data, photographs there. Then the, the people associated with the website also got interested in air pollution and they developed this sensor. And then finally, using the Bluetooth app, there is a way that you say, okay, I'm happy with what the data I'm collected now, upload this to the... Fabulous. Yeah. Now, now the competitors, you know, you mentioned there are others yeah, that do yeah, the same yeah, thing. Right, right. Did they also upload the Habitat map or... or no, they don't... How, how did they get yeah, involved in the yeah. system? So, and, uh, one of them, in fact, uh, it's called Purple Air. Now, Purple Air has an association with the Weather Underground website, if you... If, I don't know if you use that, Weather Underground. Um, so, uh, they have their own website where people can uh, upload. In fact, uh, it's, it's the opposite there, you know, that device automatically uploads it to the website and it's harder for you to get your own uh, sensors <laughs> data downloaded. It's more, not, more than the it's big not picture. Yeah, yeah, it's not impossible, but it's not very straightforward <laughs> either that you said, okay, this sensor was in my bedroom. I want to know the minute to minute data for the <laughs> that sensor. It's not straightforward as this particular device, yeah. but ev everyone else in the world will see what's going on in your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I don't mind sharing. <laughs> so so uh, last question, yeah. Sumit, and that is, uh, you, so you went to uh, a city in India, you went to a, a city in mm -hmm. Vietnam, you took these with you. Uh, did you distribute them? Uh, and, uh, you know, just, I'm asking for a lot of information here. Um, and what, who did you distribute them to? What happened? What was, what did you learn? Right. Uh, so the, this is a program the East West Center has initiated on smart cities and citizen science, air pollution stuff. So we, uh, purchased a lot of these, and I distributed these to about three or four institutions in Vietnam and a couple of institutions in India. And one of the things that I was very conscious is that our collab these institutions are collaborators in these countries. Some of them, one, one or two of them, are typical uh, science universities, uh, because they are the guys who will actually test the scientific accuracy of these devices. But I was very uh, keen and conscious that I should also distribute these to uh, some organizations who are uh, like voluntary organizations. In those or, countries. In those countries or like what we call NGOs there uh, and um, or people who sure. are from the, uh, you know, who have nothing to do, organizations or uh, who have nothing to do with science, but they're into community that's the diplomacy. Activacy, because I said ultimately, if these things have to, uh, you know, get into the hands of citizens, you guys are the intermediate, uh, uh, you know, party yeah, that sure. can help us do it. And if you, if you have problems understanding what this device can do or not do, then we need to address that first before uh, putting these in, ha into the hands of citizens. On the flip side, then we said, because you come from another perspective, you will give us some interesting ideas of how these data or the, this kind of information can be used in your countries, in your... That's uh, up to them. Up to them. But they should know the no, threat. threat. They should know uh, at the traffic light it's, it's hard, right. and in some neighborhoods or cities it's too hard, and too many people are dying from respiratory right. reaction to it. And so um, what you're doing is delivering the data right. to, to organizations... Right. 
and governments mm -hmm. that can actually improve the quality of yeah, life in those areas. Right. And that's a great gift. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sumit. This has really been Pleasure. a great Jake. discussion. Pleasure. I'm so happy to know about mm -hmm. it. And uh, I may go out and get one of those. Oh, yeah, day. sure. <laughs> it's not likely in Hawaii, but, you know, this is Yeah, but change. one of the reasons I contacted you about this is because I thought, you know, the folks in the Big Island, uh, sure. uh, yeah, they now have sure. some concerns about air pollution, yeah, right? Yeah, there it yeah. is. <laughs> we, have to, we have to be aware of this, too, <laughs> right here. <laughs> in the land of fresh air, we have to be aware. <laughs> Thank you, Sumit. Thanks, Jay. Great, great <laughs> to have you on the show. My Come pleasure. back soon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>